So uh, this is, as uh, Julian says, uh, we talk about um, I/O on persistent memory, uh, and in fact, you know, it's a um, a slightly updated presentation which myself and others have given about the outcome of a next-gen I/O project, which was a European project to look at using Intel's Optane memory in compute nodes for I/O and other things, uh, including building a a prototype system which we have up in Edinburgh, which has got 34 nodes in it and about 100 terabytes of of this memory across those 34 nodes. There's, there's three terabytes of memory per node. Um, and, you know, some of the experiences we've had with that. You know, the project finished last year. So what I'm talking about hasn't changed massively since last year, but it's, you know, there's always new people to talk to. So that's why I thought it was worth giving a, um, an overview of this. And, you know, we are doing, we are still doing new things with this uh, hardware and also we're still looking for people to come along and um, play with the hardware uh, because we have this uh, system up in Edinburgh. I can see why it needed to convert now because it's changed all my uh, templates but anyway it doesn't matter. Uh, so this is, I'm giving this presentation but it's it's um, built on work done by a lot of people uh, including direct collaborators at Edinburgh and Barcelona for some of the software work but there's a whole group of people from a range of places, including um, people, uh, organizations that are here in this workshop like ECMWF uh, and ARM and, and people like that. Um, so can you see my slides now, uh, Julian? Yes, works perfectly. Good, fine. Um, so the, the the, the whole sort of uh, point of this project <clears throat> well, was twofold. One was Intel were developing this new memory with Micron, this new <clears throat> non-volatile memory. We wanted to see how, how that could be leveraged for HPC applications and for data intensive applications and machine learning. Um, but also we had this, you know, we have this challenge in deploying data center hardware that the file system is never quite as performant as some users need. So we see these burst, bursty applications where, uh, you know, certain applications will use very large amounts of bandwidth for a small amount of time. And that can clearly slow down those applications. Um, and other applications can, you know, be doing normal IO uh, and they're fine most of the time. But if one of these bursty applications comes along, it, it significantly impacts them. And so, you know, it doesn't matter what these graphs are here, but we ended up benchmarking IO, parallel IO from applications. And, and you see some applications where the IO is generally taking five, 10 percent of the runtime. But if something heavy is happening on the system, it can easily go up to 20, 30, 40 percent of the runtime. And so our thinking was, can we use this non-volatile memory, uh, particularly because of the way it's configured, to address some of those issues? Uh, effectively, you know, the problem we have is you can, it's always possible probably to build a, a very large uh, file system with very high bandwidth, but that cost, cost really scales um, and that sort of setup really has to scale uh, massively to get to get the kind of bandwidth you need to serve some of these uh, really heavy applications. Um, and you know, it's also quite hard to do that on a provision that correctly on a machine-wide basis because you have all these competing applications. So, do you try and provision for the the peak of your I/O burst, or do you try and do something lower because you realise that most of the time most applications are not using all the IO bandwidth um, and uh, some applications will slow down because there isn't all the bandwidth they need but you take that hit. So I mean, ideally we were looking for some hardware which meant actually if you make your system bigger you get more compute nodes, you get more IO capacity because it just naturally scales with the system and using this new memory technology was seen to be one sensible way of doing that because it moves from a um, you know, a, st a storage hierarchy we have here on the sort of right hand side where we have uh, cache and memory and storage. Uh, now, of course, it's much more complicated now because we might have cache and high bandwidth memory and storage and other kinds of storage. Um, but really, 
Yeah, there, there, there would have been an animation on history has gone away. Really, what we're looking to say is, can we move to a hardware platform where actually you get rid of this external uh, disk-based or SSD-based storage? You have all your storage inside the nodes, um, and you can simplify the I/O stack, if not necessarily the I/O setup, and give you better performance <laughs> that way. So, as I said, it's all leveraging up this new class of hardware that's coming in, which we call byte addressable persistent memory, uh, which means memory which sits in your memory channels, but stores data through power cycles. Uh, and you know, that storing data through power cycles means that you can rely on it to have your data there as if it was long-term storage, even though it's sitting in the memory channels. And so the first of these class of hardware that's the market, which I'm sure you've all heard of, is this Intel Optin DC persistent memory, which sits in your memory channels as memory DIMMs, uh, but actually has a different kind of memory behind it. Uh, it has its own controllers on it to do things like encryption and um, uh, protection on there as well. Uh, and the reason that it's interesting to us, of course, is not just because it's new hardware, but because it sits in the memory channel and because of the hardware that is built on, uh, you get interesting performance. So, uh, you know, it depends on what, what Intel marketing slides you're looking at, but certainly you get much faster performance than SSDs because you're sitting in the memory channel and because of some of the hardware that have been used in the DIMMs. Uh, and you also get much larger capacity than standard DRAM. Now, of course, it's not quite true. You can you can go and buy very expensive, very large DRAM DIMMs, but on a dollar per gigabyte basis, the the capacity of this non-volatile memory is um, is is better. And so, you know, for the system we've built in Edinburgh, we have uh, 192 gigabytes of DRAM in each node, and that's across 12 DIMMs, and that's sort of quite a normal DRAM configuration. And then we have three terabytes of non-volatile memory, and that's across 12 DIMMs as well. Uh, and there, um, that's, you know, another, and, and you can get bigger, so you can go all the way up to six terabytes uh, a node if you wanted to um, here. And so, you know, that's all well and good, but, you know, why why would we use this? I mean, I could put SSDs in my node, I could put um, uh, non NVMe drives in my node and, and get fast I.O. performance without having to uh, you know, invest in uh, this kind of memory and, and stick it in my memory channels. Uh, why is that sensible? Uh, well, it's the, the fact that it's sitting in the memory channels and the way it's configured actually means you can get really quite uh, high performance from this node. So here we're running uh, a streams benchmark on the nodes and we're comparing main memory, so DDR4, with this non-volatile memory. Um, and you see the top two lines here, for the main memory on these nodes, we get about 150 gigabytes a second, um, you know, average bandwidth. And for the non-volatile memory, we get about a fifth of that. So we get about 30 uh, gigabytes a, um, a second. And so that's the kind of um, performance that we're looking to enable, 30 gigabytes a second of IO inside the nodes. And then of course, you've got, more, you know, the more nodes you have, the more I/O performance you get, and, that, and that's what we're looking to uh, achieve. And actually, you can do that with relatively little programming change. So the code at the bottom there um, is what you need to do to move from um, sort of standard use of this of, of DRAM to standard use of, of non-volatile memory. You effectively just need to change how you create your data, and then you can just use it as, as uh, standard uh, pointers within your code, assuming you're doing C and C++ style code. Uh, but, you know, um, and, and, and that's that scalability of uh, I.O. is what, what we, you know, I find quite exciting. You know, you go from one node up to 34 nodes on this system and we can scale the, the read bandwidth from, you know, uh, 50 or 60 gigabytes a second all the way up to 1.8 terabytes a second because we're adding more nodes, we're adding more I/O performance. Now there is an asynchronous, you know, there's a an imbalance between read and write performance on this hardware. It's just to do with the way the underlying memory is set up. Uh, so you only get about a a quarter or a fifth of the bandwidth for write as you do for read. 
And of course, that's going to impact your performance um, for various applications, and that needs to be taken into account. But it should be said that for these stream numbers here, you know, that's a stream stream bandwidth is uh, read plus write. Uh, so, uh, you know, it depends what exactly you hear, but this is triad stream uh, bandwidth. So we're going to have done three um, reads and one write here. So that's sort of mixed into this. But yeah, if you were just doing writes, you're not going to get quite as good performance, but it's still um, it's still good performance. You know, if we compare this to our admittedly old now, but our Luster file system on our big crane in Edinburgh, you know, the best we ever get on that is 20 bytes a second. Now, it, that's not a good file system anymore. You know, you'd want to be seeing a couple of hundred gigabytes a second, but that's for a, a system with 6,000 nodes. And here we can see, you know, 1.8, 1.9 terabytes a second read and, and 300, 150, 300 uh, gigabytes a second write just from 34 nodes. Um, so that's, that's the performance there. Uh, so that scalability in the nodes is, is what's interesting to me, but of course, I'm sure, as you're all aware, that's not necessarily going to be easy to use. So there's some a whole bunch of usage issues around that. But the other side of this memory, which I like, is the is the moving away from I/O altogether. So I know this is the the I/O sig, but um, I, you know, one of the benefits of using this kind of memory is you can you can uh, stop using it in an I/O way where you have sort of bulk read and bulk write functionality. Uh, and you can start just treating it as memory. So you can just have your data in memory in whatever format you need it. You know, if you've got a three dimensional array, you can have it sitting in memory and you can just uh, open that up and close it from the hardware, not have to rebuild the data and not have to re-index it, all those kind of things. Um, and why is that interesting? Well, here on my graph on the left hand side, I'm doing some IO benchmarking uh, and uh, I'm comparing file access, which is called FSDAX in these slides, versus going directly to the memory uh, API and not using this file stuff anymore, that PMDK stuff. And you can see on the left-hand side, I don't see any real performance difference between file access and, and going to um, the memory directly. So it doesn't look like it's very beneficial. But in the right-hand side, I'm doing exactly the same benchmark, but instead of writing, I think, one gigabyte, one megabyte chunks, which is on my left hand side. On the right hand side, I'm writing in 256 byte chunks. So I'm accessing um, a couple of cache lines or a cache line at a time uh, here, and I'm reading and writing that data. Um, and you can see now here the PMDK reads and writes are a couple of orders of magnitude uh, higher bandwidth than the FSDAX, the file system reads and writes. And so that's the kind of other uh, benefit that I think this memory offers. But now, this is just a more detailed look at that same benchmark. This is now single node. Um, and then on the top, we have, um, sorry, on the left hand side, we have using the file system. And on the right hand side, we, we're going directly to the, the memory ha hardware here. And then the different bars are just different sizes of. Uh, I/O request, so going from 128 byte I/O operations all the way up to 16 megabyte I/O operations, and all we can see here is that the accessing this hardware, you know, all these benchmarks run on the same hardware, but accessing this hardware using the memory interface on the right hand side means that I can get my full I/O performance. Um, and here, this is uh, about 50 or 60, or about 70 gigabytes a second. A read performance and about 12 gigabytes a second of write performance. I can get my best performance by doing small I/O operations, uh, and actually I can do you know a whole range of small I/O operations, all up to about 64 kilobytes. Uh, get great read performance, and 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 likewise with my write performance. So that means that I can move away from a programming model where I'm doing, um, you know, sporadic, but large amounts of I/O of reading or writing data to get good performance, which is what we tend to do for large scale parallel applications to one where I'm doing frequent and small amounts of I/O, uh, to, and I can still get that same performance. As you can see from these graphs here, I actually get better performance if I don't saturate the memory bus, 
doing large chunks of IO. We, you know, there's a there's a a bit of a cash effect I think going on in here. But at some point we hit a a read uh, cliff um, where if we go too big, um, then it, then we saturate some of our lower level caches in the CPU and we and we we slow down a bit. So that I think is the potentially longer term benefit of this hardware. The fact that we could move away from a sort of file-based POSIX I/O operations to something that looks much more like, you know, reading and writing small amounts of data from arrays or from uh, complex data structures in place, um, and potentially going forward, that could mean that if a, the hardware was enabled for it, we would need much smaller amounts of DRAM much small amounts of expensive in terms of energy memory in the nodes uh, to, to have our hot data in uh, and then have our cold data sitting in the non-volatile memory on each node um, but easy to access uh, if I if I um, program it in the right way uh, and so we are starting now to play with this kind of stuff but here you know I've just done a, a little play around with a small uh, toy cfd code where it has a uh, sorry not cfd image processing code here where it has a image data set which is going to process but it never updates it, it uses that image data as a input and it generates some new data on the output but it never updates that old the input data uh, and then i can reprogram it so that i store that read only data in this non-volatile memory um, um, and then store my write data in the DRAM. Uh, and actually, if I run that, uh, we have the timings on the bottom here, um, and I have virtually no. I mean, storing the read on the data in the, in the non volatile memory um, increases the overall runtime by about two or three percent, sort of reproducibly, um, but, but nothing more than that. Um, and, you know, depending on the application, for a quite a substantial reduction in the amount of volatile memory you happen to use uh, and that could be important going forward for some of the architectures we're, we're seeing coming down the roads so things like the um, Fujitsu A64FX processor where you've only got 32 gigabytes of main memory if you could couple that with non-volatile memory in the nodes which of course you can't with the Intel stuff at the moment because that's Intel memory and not Fujitsu memory but hopefully in the, in the next couple of years we'll see some some of the non-volatile memory coming out of Fujitsu hitting the market as well then you could have a small amount of on-chip fast memory and then have your storage um, elsewhere in the node in the terms of um, non-volatile memory. Of course, you know, there are caveats to this. You know, once you start moving into the in-memory storage space, then you start hitting things like um, NUMA issues. So here we can see actually left-hand side graph if you program this memory, but you don't take into account NUMA issues and you just do all your reads and write from a single NUMA region, you get about a quarter of performance in read and, and, and much lower performance in terms of write than if you do proper NUMA aware programming in the graph on the left hand side. Um, uh, and But it's relatively straightforward, you know, because it is just memory. So the NUMA stuff is pretty straightforward. Well, you know, it's a little bit nasty, but you just have to work out what processor and what socket you're on um, and then you can uh, easily mount that and actually some of the tools that come with this PMDK library that we're using here um, are actually starting to automatically do that for you so there's some NUMA aware config coming on for you uh, but of course there's a couple of things to be aware of I know I'm nearly out of time so I'll wrap it up quick uh, but there's a couple of things to be aware of you know really using it like this you have to change your application uh, and that may be easier for some applications than others. Uh, now, as I said, it's relatively straightforward to change your application to use this in the sense that you just have to change where you have memory. But the, the challenging part is deciding what memory you put where. And of course, if you do that wrong, you're going to get bad performance for your application as a whole. So that's um, quite a critical thing to do. It's a design choice rather than an implementation issue. You need to sort of work out what memory can go where. Uh, but of course, um, you can just use this as as um, as a file system. 
if you're not ready to change your application. And so we've shown on this prototype that things like you, we took open foam and, and people have seen these results before probably, but we took open foam and you know writing and reading to this non-volatile memory comparing to, to an external file system like Lustre, we could um, do a very big uh, solver, open foam solver, where we turned the IO quite significantly. So we produced a lot of IO um, and you know most people don't do this for open foam but that's partially because the io is so expensive so we said you know what happens if we turn the io um right up uh, and and this 20 nodes uh, 960 mpi processor job on the right hand side is an example of that um in the luster it takes um 600 seconds to do the solver um and if we use the non-volatile memory it takes about 80 seconds uh, and the difference between that and the results on the left hand side, other than slightly different numbers of processes, is we've turned up the amount of I.O. being done between the left and the right hand results. And you can see that we can turn up the amount of I.O. being done uh, and this 66 seconds on the 16 nodes only becomes 78 seconds on the 20 nodes. And um, so we can punch out much more data to this local storage and not really impact the performance. And that's just going through the file system stuff. We've not doing any fancy um, stuff, fancy uh, optimizations. Um, and then I stuck this slide in because Julian was talking about workflows in his presentation. You know, that's the, that's another thing that we think is very interesting, this idea that now the storage is in the node, you can leave data behind and you can run your jobs on the node where the data was produced rather than moving the data to the compute nodes. Uh, and so here's an example of a, it's a synthetic workflow, but we have a workflow which has got four stages. Left hand side is on, on Lustre, uh, right hand side is on the non-volatile memory and keeping the data between the workflow stages on in the non-volatile memory between runs. And we can see that these of the IO stages, which the bit on the graphs get much, much smaller uh, and much shorter in that stage. So we can get our overall runtime of our workflow down because we're not having to do this movement of data to compute nodes and back again th through the Lustre file system. We can dump the data to the non-volatile memory on the host and then just use it there. But of course we're not we're not um uh we're not um unaware of the fact that this is all really nice theoretically, but you know how do you get this to work inside a multi-tenant multi-user a HPC system where jobs can run anywhere uh, and the storage inside the nodes, not outside the nodes. Um, and so, you know, a big portion of this project was working on uh, some of these things, data schedulers and job schedulers and uh, integration with um, job schedulers to uh, make sure you could run jobs anywhere, but the data would be there when you needed it and then workflows would understand where the data was. So we've done some Slurm extension stuff, which we still need to push back to um, uh, the, the Slurm mainline and see if it will go back in there. We've not got round to it yet uh, with one thing and another, but uh, we introduced this idea of workflows into the Slurm uh, source code, which we have, which lets you schedule a bunch of jobs which are um, connected. And it's very much like Slurm dependencies, but, but enhanced a bit. Um, so we can do things like ensure that jobs run on the same nodes. Um, and then understand the data flow uh, dependencies through that because we've also added in um, sort of stage in, stage out, persist keywords into Slurm, very much like the burst buffer functionality in Slurm, which, which matched up with the workflow stuff, lets you say, okay, this data is here, um, keep it here, run the job there, those kind of things. And so that lets us do these kind of pre-staging of data onto the nodes, maintaining data on the nodes, moving data off the nodes um, when it's completed. Uh, and we have a, a data scheduler component built by our, our, our colleagues at Vast Learner called Norns, which will move this data on and off nodes as required as well. So the, the batch system, Slurm will trigger that and the data movements will happen. Um, and then there are other things that were developed there. So uh, parallel file system across across the nodes called GeckoFS, which I'll skip ahead to, um, to support applications which which can't use the in-node storage and where you need a 
unified parallel file system, but you don't want to go to an external luster. Um, so that's quite an interesting Fuse-based file system. It's still a work in progress, so we still need to optimize it up to um, best performance, but it, it does it does reasonably well. You know, we got some quite nice numbers from the IO500 last year, except that um, whilst when we did it, uh, Intel DAOs came along um, and uh, and blew us out of the water using the same kind of hardware we're using. So that's another option for using this hardware as well. So you can run Intel's DAOs object store across it and it, it will expose you a set of interfaces like file system interfaces, but also things like MPI and HDF5 interfaces for your applications to use. Um, so I think those are all options for applications, but as I say, in the long term, I my hope is that we move away from these file systems to much more of this memory storage setup, um, because I think that's where the benefit is. Uh, as I said at the beginning, we have this hardware sitting in Edinburgh, um, so if there's anybody interested in using it for applications, do do drop us an email because we, you know, keen to collaborate with people on this. Um, but I think there's some nice new hardware coming up. It's it's around. It will be in um, compute systems going forward. In some some of the procurements in America have it coming in 2021, 22. Um, so I think it has potential, real potential for improved performance. But of course, it needs some software around it to support users. Some of the things we've been looking at, like batch system integration, job data schedulers, those kind of stuff. And it also will require some application porting to get the best performance. But you can still use it without doing that. And so that's all I wanted to say. Apologies if you've heard it all before, um, but I'm going to take questions if there are any now or in the virtual coffee break as well.